Assurance is so important, and there's two extremes, and both of them are very, very dangerous. One of the most important doctrines in, in all the Bible is the doctrine of a believer's assurance. What does that mean? That the believer has a biblical foundation for his or her confidence that they are in a right relationship with God. If you know anything about the great truths of Christianity, you'll be able to see why assurance is so very important. You see, Christianity is not about just getting your best life here on earth or fixing a few of your problems. Christianity deals with life and death, heaven and hell, where a person will spend the rest of eternity. And therefore, knowing that these ideas, these concepts are so weighty, we can understand why it is important that a true believer who believes in heaven and hell and that there is an eternal place of either great blessing or great anguish where they're going to go, you can see why it would be so important for them to have assurance of salvation. Now, also in the Bible, we can see that it is God's will that people have assurance. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, John gives us the reason why he writes this letter. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, you may have the assurance that you have eternal life. It is God's desire that every true believer have assurance of salvation. Now, today... In the world, in the church, we see two very extremely dangerous extremes. One of them is basically the extreme that is found in my country, in North America, uh, but has also gone out now into the whole world. And it's this. It's, it's an extreme that basically has reduced the gospel down to nothing more than a little creed. And if you pray a prayer and ask Jesus to come in, then the preacher tells you, you now have eternal life. Now, there's nothing biblical about that, and it's very, very dangerous. And because of it, countless millions of people believe they're Christians and they're not. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is this, that you could spend your entire life believing in Christ and never have assurance. Because in order to have assurance of salvation, you must experience some, some just momentous spectacular spectacular work of God in your life in which either your heart is crushed and you're left weeping on the floor or light appears to you and it all this truth comes flooding in and it's a dramatic experience and, and that's not true either there is a balance and the balance is this salvation only comes through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ how do we know then that we have this faith in Jesus Christ? Well, there is an inner witness of the Spirit of God in which God gives us peace. God testifies to our heart that we have become the children of God. But that's not the only evidence. First John was actually written so that by reading through First John, those who were truly converted might grow in their assurance of salvation. So John gives us a series of tests by which we can compare our own life. For example, he says, um, I'll just give you one of the tests. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And what he's saying is this. God is not some hidden God with a hidden secret will that you cannot know. But God is light. He has revealed to you who he is in the scriptures and what his will desires of you. Then it goes on. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. John is saying, if we say we're Christian, but we are constantly walking 
in darkness. That means we're walking in a way that disagrees with what God has told us about himself and his will. Constantly living in rebellion, constantly living in sin. Then there's no evidence that we're truly converted. But he says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John says, if we walk in the light, it's one of the evidences that we are converted. It's one of the fruits of conversion. Now, you might be saying, well, Brother Paul, walking in the light. I mean, I, I believe in Jesus. I seem to be growing in my obedience, but I still sin. I don't walk in the light all the time. But what you need to understand is John is not talking about sinless perfection. John is talking about a style of life. That after your supposed conversion, you begin to see your life changing in a way that increasingly conforms more and more to what God has told us about himself and about his will. He's not talking about sinless perfection because the very next test is this. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, then we're definitely not a Christian. The truth is not even in us. We don't even understand who God is or who we are. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what this is talking about? One of the greatest evidences that you're a Christian is that you begin to see more and more sin in your life. And when you do, it breaks your heart, leads you to repentance and leads you to confession. That one of the greatest marks of truly being a child of God is that your life is marked by brokenness over sin and confession of it. Even though we grow as Christians and should have greater and greater victory over sin, it's a long, long process. And we're never going to be fully free from sin until the day Christ returns. Assurance is so important and there's two extremes and both of them are very, very dangerous. What you need to know is this. We're saved by faith, but if Christ has truly saved you, he who began a good work in you will finish it and will continue working and you will bear fruit. Thank you.